The big game is set. Make your winning move today and bet at my bookie. Use promo code Gators and claim your deposit match redeemable up to $1,000. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on social media at GatorDave underscore SEC. And back together for the first time in a couple of weeks with my co-host, Will Miles. You can find him at readingreaction.com. Really good article he put up there, uh, shared this morning. It kind of goes into what we were going to discuss here with the transfer portal anyway. So uh, it goes hand in hand there with what Will Miles put up there at readingreaction.com on YouTube at Reading Reaction as well. Will, getting back together again, my friend. Absolutely, man. We're almost ready for national signing day now. So, uh, you know, <laughs> something's actually going to happen what, now what beyond just rumors. So, what's that? What is that now? What is, what is, what is February <laughs> national signing day now? Boy, did they ruin that holiday? <laughs> so they, uh, I know like, I was like, I, I was even thinking to myself before we went live, not long before I was like, that's next week. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just unreal. What, uh, I mean, it's been this way for a few years now, but still, it still stings that there's just not that that February signing day. Yeah, they need to they need to do this for like the transfer portal where like you don't get to sign until a certain day, so it all comes down in one day, as opposed to just leaking out over months. Because then at least you've got one day of euphoria or one day of complete misery. But uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, it's it's interesting. College football has never really done things in a linear fashion to make the product better and, and I own the transfer portal is sort of doing that here and uh it sort of screws up our calendar a little bit but hey it gives us stuff to talk about all off season I suppose so uh, but I tell you what yeah. it's made and we know this because you, you listen to Josh Payne of course you know the national podcast there and he te- keeps teasing that you know there's going to be some big changes in college football but the, the crux of it is of course December uh, and what, how, how much is that going to change with the college football playoff coming up when you know the first week of the first round of the playoffs is the same week as early signing day? So you got get you you have teams getting ready to hit the road, go play a road playoff game, all while trying to sign a signing class. It's just it makes no sense. Uh, there, there might so. be a reason why Nick Saban decided to hang him up. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So I mean. Hey, get paid nine million dollars to do that, but only so many people are qualified to do that. Right? <laughs> uh, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know uh, if you're getting hired, Will, but uh, if you do, if you do, I'll, I'll I'll come be OC or I can count to eleven. We'll special get into teams that. coordinator, yeah. Dave. We'll, special we'll teams that. coordinator. We'll get into that just a little bit. I can count to eleven. So, uh, but the Gators are hiring somebody. I think can count to eleven as well. So we'll get to that. But hey, uh, like I said, transfer portal. We'll get into the special teams coach hire as well. And a little bit of Paul Feinbaum uh, comments today, and it's more of a. I wanted to ask you know Gator Nation that listens to hear hear the Gators break down their thoughts on that, and if they feel the same way of uh, no excitement around the Florida Gators program right now. So. A little bit of apathy uh, setting in. That's what Paul, Paul Feinbaum had to say. So, so we'll get into that. I don't want to uh, you know, share too much uh, from the national perspective uh, there. But that, that one kind of caught me. And I kind of wanted to get uh, Gator Nation and share what I've seen uh, on Gators Breakdown Plus and, and through Gator Nation since the end of the season, signing day, early signing day, all that good stuff there. So everybody hit that like button. Subscribe to Gators Breakdown if you haven't done so yet. But smash that like button. It really, really helps us out right here on Gators Breakdown. And uh, one, one more announcement, Will. I, I put it on Twitter this morning, but if people missed it, Trayon Webb will be on the podcast later this week, running back Trayon Webb. First time we really get to hear from him since uh, coming to Gainesville. You know, since he was a freshman last year, not really able to talk to the media. Uh, but Trayon Webb will be on Gators Breakdown later this week. And we get to hear from the second-year running back, Will. And of course, a lot more carries going his way with Trevor Etienne now at Rival Georgia. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's going to be a lot open up for him there. A lot of opportunities. You've got you got Cam Carroll coming back as well from his injury. So there's a lot of dy- a lot of dynamics going on in that room. And certainly, Montrell Johnson is the guy who's established, and we know he's going to get a bunch of carries. But all those carries that were going to ATN, it's not as though uh, it's not as though Billy Napier has been somebody who's just picked one running back and, and ridden him. And so I wouldn't expect that to continue. And so it'll be interesting to hear what Webb thinks about his prospects for picking up those carries from ETN and maybe what he picked up. 
from ETN. And honestly, I'd be kind of curious as to what he feels about one of his buddies from his position room going to play for the bitter rivals and sort of what that does to the relationships and how that spices up the rivalry and all that sort of stuff. I'm sure you'll get into all of that stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that'll be a recording that Wednesday. Uh, so we'll see either come out Wednesday evening or uh, around Thursday, but try on web later this week on Gators breakdown. One more time, smash that like button, subscribe right here on Gators breakdown. If you haven't done so yet. So, well, let's get into some transfer portal talk here. And of course, um, I'm going to say it right this time, Asa Turner, as I was saying, as a Turner last week, but Asa Turner, uh, the latest making 11 transfers for the Gators through the transfer portal. Seven will seven of them reside on the defensive side of the football. And of course it was needed. Uh, could argue overall Florida could, should make some more roster space to help on the offensive side uh, with more numbers on that side. And maybe that happens after spring practice. We've got one more portal window coming up and we'll, um, you know, see what Florida decides to do with some players that are still current the roster and uh, what happens throughout spring practice. But of course, will the defensive side of the ball still where the biggest side of improvement needs to show up? Uh, but looking at it, highest ranked in the in the class right now, the transfer portal class, defensive lineman Joey Slackman, followed by Grayson Howard, the linebacker there, and of course, cornerback Jameer Grimsley. If you want to count him as a transfer, you don't really have to <laughs> or, or not. But uh, of course, a class of 2024 guy, no matter. Uh, which way you, you you spin it, but well, it's a, a for the defense um, and the levels of defense where Florida needs help. You know, it's a mix of experience and potential. But you know, there's one player at, at each, le- each level on defense that kind of fits in that category that should be seen as impactful. As I mentioned, defensive lineman Joey Slatman up front. You got Grayson Howard at linebacker, uh, and then the most recent transfer there of uh, Asa Turner at safety. So one at each level. And then if you even want to spread it out wide a little bit, uh, you got Triquez Bridges, who could also possibly start at safety or nickel spot. Uh, so you have players at every level that could possibly start right here to the transfer portal for the Gators. Starters, instant impact. And Will kind of ties into your latest there at Reading Reaction and shows where Florida needs to get better on defense and have these instant impact type of players through the portal, these players is where you start. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, look, Florida was below average at corner. They were below average at safety and they were well below average at linebacker. I use pro football focus numbers to to sort of average out different units in power five and then looked at compared Florida to Alabama and Georgia and Texas A&M and some of those teams that were top 20, at least in defense in the SEC. And Florida obviously struggled. LSU struggled a lot, too. And what you found was not necessarily that. Um, you know, every program out there had elite play everywhere. I think Georgia was probably the closest to having very good play everywhere. But what you found was pretty average play at like three or four spots and then a couple spots on defense where they had excellent play. So Alabama specifically corner and safety, safety excelled Texas A&M linebacker. And I believe safety was where they excelled, but then they were sort of average along the entire, the rest of the defense. So they didn't have a weak link and Florida had three weak links last year. And that's one of the reasons why the defense was so poor. So when you talk about them taking in transfers who are sort of, who are all across the spectrum at all different positions, in many ways, this is a way of supplementing some of the <laughs> supplementing some of the guys that they've got um, that they they're hoping to build from those freshmen who got a lot of time last year. The guys like Jordan Castell and Bryce Thornton at the safety position, but being able to back those guys up with Asa Turner, being able to back those guys up with DJ Douglas, and look, Douglas Turner, Triquez Bridges, Joey Slackman, George Gums, these, those are all guys who have significant amounts of experience, so they're not necessarily relying on true freshmen, and I think. There was a lot made of Florida having the youngest team in the country last year. A lot of the guys they're bringing in through the transfer portal, especially on the defensive side of the ball, are not necessarily – they don't fit the profile of young guys, right? These are guys who are going to come in, compete for time, play for a year, and then be out. And I think that's one of the things that's – that's important to recognize is two things. One is that Florida, it's not just the guys Florida's bringing into the transfer portal. In many ways, it's who they're replacing. That was something that I went into in the article pretty significantly. So if you look at some of the guys who are being replaced, Human Milan was up around, I think, 73 for his rating at Pro Football Focus, but Scooby Williams was 42.1. 
Jenin Hill was 63.9. Um, Jalen Kimber was 69.7. Miguel Mitchell, 55.7. And 70 is usually around average. So they had a, a safety who played 385 snaps in Miguel Mitchell, who was at 55.7, so 15 points below average. They had a linebacker who played 455 snaps in Scooby Williams, who was at 42.1, so almost 30 points below average. So you don't necessarily need to get – elite play from a pup Howard coming in immediately. But if he can come in and be in like the 65 to 70 range in terms of his pro football focus rating, now you're talking about a major step forward for the defense, not because you've got elite play at that position, but just because you've got replacement level play at that position, right? That you're getting enough quality there that now then you hope that Slackman comes in and is able to be an elite guy, that Caleb Banks takes the next next step forward, that Justice Boone coming back really makes the makes the edge position outstanding, that Jordan Castell is able to take a step forward from his freshman year to his sophomore year, that Shamar James turns into the star that we know he can be and stays healthy. And so you're no longer just saying, oh my God, I hope that everything turns out well. If you can get average all the way around, you only need a couple of guys to really excel to have a unit that's really, really good. And I think that's sort of the take home for me from the transfer portal is they've kind of shotgunned all over the place. But I think in many ways, that's making sure they get average play at each position. And then they're going to hope that they get somebody who really breaks through at a couple of those positions. And all of a sudden, you're looking at a top 20 or top 30 defense. So, Will, while, while I got it pulled, pulled up here, here's your, um, you know, the. Um, Graphics you used to put together to kind of show did now these were using the pro football focus grades, right? And the mm-hmm. average at positions here, see how Florida compares to Alabama, and then the three better defenses in the SEC, Georgia, Alabama, Texas AM. If you want to explain these further, Will, I, I'll keep this up. But one thing that I did want to kind of point out is, and maybe you have more of this and can explain it, but what we see here, the relationship between position groups and edge rusher to corner play. Cause you got you know, How many times have we heard the relationship between, Oh, the pressure up front and you'll get better back in play. And that kind of <laughs> actually does bear out here in these graphics of, Hey, better edge rushers. You know what? Kind of, tra- uh, kind of translates to better corner play at the same time. A little bit. I mean, I think some of that just has to do with those defenses are better. And quite honestly, (laughs) some of the players are better. So the way pro football focus works and the reason that I'm using it here, and I wouldn't use it for everything. And I think sometimes it's misused when you, so like when you saw early in the year, there were a lot of people looking at the pass rush win rate for princely human Milan and like, look, he's like top five in the country. But you got to actually go look at his overall stats because there was stuff in there about the run game that pulled his overall score down. And you can see that if you look at his complete season, that does indicate that he has some significant strengths. It also indicates that he has some significant weaknesses. And the way pro pro football focus works is they, they take each play and look at each player and try to grade based on what they think he was supposed to do. Did he do what he was supposed to do successfully? So that's supposed to sort of take the the relationship between these positions away right now it doesn't because if a guy's pass rushing off the edge and a quarterback has to go to his second or third read he's got more time to get home and you know it's a subjective rating but the hope is is that over 700 snaps over the course of the year that you get a pretty good idea of of where guys excel. And I think that's what you see with the charts that I put in the article today is that each of the charts sort of shows where each team is. Are you going (laughs) to like, you know, I sort of looked at it as a, you know, as a, as a red face test, like, all right, do I think Alabama's edge rushers were better than Florida's? Yeah. (laughs) Did I think Alabama's corners were better than Florida's? Yeah, by a significant margin. What about their safeties? What about their linebackers? And you can all of a sudden start sort of going around and saying, but I mean, think about it, right? I don't recall calling out an interior lineman or a linebacker for Alabama as a real star. You Dallas Turner at the edge, you had Ricks and and some other guys there at corner. You've got so you can actually think of the guys, Terry and Arnold, there you can think of the guys at each of these positions where that are really pulling those values up. 
And I don't know. I can't. I couldn't name you an interior lineman for Alabama or a linebacker at Alabama who specific. Like a couple of years ago, Henry well, Toe. First time in how long, too? Well, right. So again, <laughs> I'm not saying that you just need average play at linebacker position. What I'm saying is, is that you don't need elite play everywhere to have an elite defense, and that's actually borne out. I looked at some of these t- types of charts for Penn State, and Michigan, and some of those other teams as well. I don't have them in the article, but. I looked at some of those things and you see the same general principle. What I will say is that corner and safety seems to be the most common thread for defenses that are really good, that in an era where you're spreading people out, where you're trying to throw, um, where you're running a lot of RPOs and you need to be able to make tackles in space and you need to be able to cover guys one-on-one with man defense, and where you're running those simulated pressures where you've got defensive ends dropping into coverage. And so you're going to have some times where cornerbacks get exposed and have to be able to cover, cover. That's something where I think you're seeing I, – I do think there's a trend there. I think safety and I think corner are critical. So, again, I think when you talk about Ace Turner being somebody who's coming from Washington, had a pro football focus ranking of 72.4 last year, but has done that over a couple of years now at, at, at Washington. You look at DJ Douglas was 70.7 last year. The average for a corner I think is like 68, 69. So Florida is bringing in two guys at safety who are – slightly above average in terms of their overall play. Now, can they take another step and get even better? Maybe. But even if they just give you average play, Castell was actually five points above average last year at safety. So you take those three guys, one, you can sustain an injury, but two, you're sort of at a at a floor. You should get average safety mm-hmm. play. And, oh, we would have begged for average safety play last year. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll go through all 11. Asa Turner, of course, the most recent. Jameer Grimsley coming late last week as well. Quarterback Clay Millen, you mentioned DJ Douglas there at safety. Uh, uh, Devin Manuel there for the offensive uh, lineman from Arkansas. At edge, George Gums. Linebacker Grayson Howard. At wide receiver, you have Chimray DK. Chaquez Bridges at corner. Joey Slackman defensive line. And the first one to get it all started through the transfer portal was Brandon Crenshaw Dixon there at offensive tackle. Well, something I, 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 I found myself doing over the weekend is – and it was kind of before I even decided to to make this so much of the episode, but team rate DK, uh, you know, we just talked about defense and fixing the defense and we know that every level when it's going to be fixed at, but you know, Florida losing to Mickey Pearsall, we wouldn't see Trey Wilson take that next step, but you know, he can't be the only weapon there at receiver. Florida goes with a Graham Mertz familiar face there and team rate DK there at Wisconsin, and going through and, and, and just kind of looking at what he brings to the table, he did line up inside and outside for Wisconsin. Single wide receiver on one side sometimes. Catch and run ability showed that a lot there at, at Wisconsin and showed the and something that did catch my eye and something I think we will see at Florida given what we've seen the last couple of years from a Billy Napier offense. The ability to get, get some yards on reverses, some handoffs on so, some of those reverses there. So you can see if you go, there's a, there's a highlight video, like eight minutes long of, of, of him on YouTube. And you can see in just those season, two seasons ago, his best season, that season worth of highlights, you can glean a lot from how Florida's going to use him at wide receiver and hopefully give Trey Wilson some help and Graham Mertz another weapon at the position. Yeah, so last year was his worst season. So it's actually interesting that he had three really good se- or three reasonably good seasons with Graham Mertz there. Mertz leaves, and all of a sudden DK struggles a little bit. And a coaching I, change, <laughs> and a coaching change. Yeah, I, I think the I think the big thing for 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 DK is that he because of what you just said about the reverses, about those sorts of things. That's going to free up Trey Wilson to do some other things. They're not going to have to use him in some of the ways that they used last year. Uh, over on the Patreon page this week or last week I actually put up a highlight from the Buffalo Bills game they they put it they had uh, um, Shakir um, Khalil Shakir is sort of what I would what I would uh, state is their Trey Wilson they use him in all sorts of different configurations and and they put Kansas City in a blender on a fourth and three play where they had all sorts of motion going all over the place but the only way that works is if you've got them do playing man-to-man all over the place and um That's the thing is that Florida is going to have to find a way at the wide receiver position in order to make that happen. Now, if DK can do some stuff that allows Trey Wilson to go on the outside and start to do some things downfield, well, that obviously opens up a new um, a new area for his game and take some tread off the tires too. you think you think about 
all the times that like Wilson played great last year, but missed a bunch of games because he was injured at various times. Those little nine yard, you know, the little nine yard sort of uh, puff passes that go out there to the edge. I mean, you get hit every time you do that. Right. And so there is an opportunity to offload some of that load, especially when you're playing lesser teams to make sure you've got Trey Wilson available for that. So if nothing else, I think DK provides that where it's just, you know, we talk about running back sharing the load, but Trey Wilson caught a boatload of balls last year. And a bunch of them were things for like seven, eight, nine yard gains on the outside where you want to give it to him. Cause you, you hope he, you, we know he's going to have the ability to eventually put his foot in the ground and break one of those things. At the same time, do you want him getting hit essentially like a running back on a reverse all year long Or do you want to start putting that in the hands of somebody else and then maybe using that as a decoy to get Trey Wilson open down the field? Because I suspect they're going to start using some, not necessarily run pass options, but give Mertz the ability to say, hey, I'm not going to pitch the ball forward. I'm going to try to hit Trey Wilson on a slant. And all of a sudden, now you got him going off the end zone. Similar to the touchdown pass we saw Mm -hmm. against Georgia, where he sort of comes in on that slant, catches it, and is able to take it to the house. Because that's the best way to utilize Trey Wilson is get him out there in space with a head of steam against the safety, as opposed to having to make him run around the entire defensive line. Will, your thoughts, um, kind of, you know, honestly, this is the first time you and I have really talked a, a lot with this with this transfer portal in the recent weeks, in the recent gets. Man, what would you think about how it all worked out with Jameer Grimsley? Uh, of course, uh, uh, it was a, an original miss uh, for, for the Florida staff. And as I said, and, you know, in that episode with getting Grimsley, this is why you keep the door open. This is why you keep those relationships. You and I just talked about the new world of college football uh, to, to start this episode, and that's just what it's going to be. You you may miss that first go around, uh, but with this, the, the way college football is set up now, you keep the relationship open. You let them visit. I, I don't care if you think it's wasting time. You let them visit as many times as they want. You keep that relationship going as a, as a high school recruit because – now the timeline, you don't even know, you don't know when it might pay off. It may pay off two weeks after National Signing Day. It may pay off two years down the road. It, it's just, um, but it, that's to me, besides the player, that's the main takeaway for me with Jameer Grimsley is just how far it ended up with him. And, you know, as I said, it, 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 it's amazing the Nick Saban effect for Florida, Grimsley, Turner in some way because DeBoer gets the job and maybe Turner just, returns to Washington. That was in the cards as well. Uh, but with a new staff there, he doesn't stick around. He wanted some familiarity, so he goes to Florida where he has a relationship with Harris. But all that happens because Nick Saban retires. I mean, we talked about all the storylines in, in college football. I mean, Florida was big benefactor of transfer portal and of Nick Saban's retirement. Yeah, I mean, I think it points out to me that, you know, you've never wanted to burn bridges. I mean, you don't want to burn bridges in life anyway, right? I yeah. mean, your best, life, even if you hate your job, you, you, it's not really a great thing to go into your boss and tell him everything that you think that's terrible about the company. When you leave, it's like, hey, it's just not a good fit. And you, and you sort of move on because at some point downstream, you may need that person in your life to help you, or you may need to come back and actually, uh, actually work with that person in a different capacity, especially if you're in the same field. And I think that's sort of the same way that I would imagine and this goes when it comes to college football recruiting is, you know, in the past, you sort of kept good relationships because you didn't want it to get back to other people that, hey, he'll torture relationship if you don't go to his school. That's a negative thing. But now there's that ac- extra added incentive of you might get a shot at the guy two or three years down the road. And I'm actually working on something right now. So I was looking at, um, again, I've really been diving into the pro football focus numbers. And I was looking at Jordan Castell ranked 17th overall this year out of all defensive players in his draft class. Mm. But he ranked 473rd out of all defensive players in college football. And that, to me, is really what's going to change. And the thing we need to start thinking about when it comes to roster construction is Florida spent a year last year training Jordan Castell how to play safety. He actually played pretty well when you look at his overall work. Now, I think there's a lot to be gained in open field tackling and preventing some of the big plays. But I think, by and large, he did his job and played pretty well. That's great, but that only matters if two years from now he's taken a leap forward and he's performing for your organization. And so the the 
<laughs> the way things are going to work these days is I, I think and until things change is he's going to have options to go elsewhere as he sort of steps into that role of being a star, just like Asa Turner just did. Right. And so um, you're, these are not closed things where Turner and Castell, if they were in, the, they're not in the same draft class, but guys who are in the same recruiting class, they all know each other. They've all go on, gone on official visits. They've all competed with each other in camps. They all talk. And so the idea that you would ever want to put something out there negative, just, I mean, I don't understand why you would do it unless you're somebody established like Kirby smart, like Nick Saban, um, you know, somebody who can say, look, you, I don't need you. <laughs> There's 10 other guys lining up to play for my organization. Florida's not there. So it's great that they kept the lines open for Grimsley. DeAndre Robinson, the the, the yep. transfer from Texas. I mean, that's a guy who's sort of in the same boat as Grimsley. Like he's categorized differently, but same recruiting class. This will be the yeah, first time they've actually, actually played games. And he's, a, he's actually a signee. So that's the, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the difference there. So, I mean, there's a di different categorization, yeah. but it's the same general principle, right? And there, you look at Texas. Texas was really going heavy in the, in the transfer portal as well. And, you know, at one point I was sitting there thinking, geez, how does Texas have enough scholarships for all these people? <laughs> and in some ways, that might have been one of the reasons why Robinson was looking, right, is that you look at the roster and you go, oh, that early playing time I thought I was going to have that's not going to materialize. Let's transfer now rather than waiting for a year behind somebody not getting to play and then deciding to transfer. So I think you're going to see a lot of that too. I'm curious what happens in the spring, right? I mean, you think mm -hmm. about the fall transfer portal has been nuts. The spring transfer portal last year was kind of lackluster in terms of the quality of players who left. Yep. But I do wonder now with the sort of um, – with, with the negative aspects of transferring really sort of, I mean, no one's getting called out for doing what's best for them anymore. There's no like negative connotation when you transfer even to like your team's biggest rival. There's not a whole lot of, of consternation that goes on. People just go, all right, whatever, now I'll root against you. And, and with that going on, I do wonder whether the spring is going to be a little bit more lively, especially as some folks lose battles in the spring. Um, you know, and, and will there be more guys available or is it going to be lackluster like it was last year? I'm curious to see what happens. Um, I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen. I haven't really thought about it that much, but that's a place where I think, you know, obviously I think Florida still could have some work to do, but my guess is they'll probably lose two or three guys to the transfer portal after the spring anyway. So it'll be one of those things where three and three out and sort of go from there. Yeah, that's kind of where I, mean, I, I believe now with Turner, Florida's at 86 uh, by some measures of there. So that's fine for spring. It's going to be there at 85 in fall camp. Um, of course, some guys who, you know, earned scholarships last year, you know, may not be on scholarship or whatever, but the count kind of going from who had scholarships last year. And of course, the transfers Florida's brought in, I believe 86 uh, right now is the number. Well, if we do look at it, you, you mentioned that could Florida by the springtime. I think the questions are, can they do more at wide receiver? Can they do more at edge? Can they do more at offensive line? Whether that be probably on the inside at, at offensive guard. You know, did Florida do enough to improve? I, I, I do think they improved the team. I'd say yes, but here's another here's here's the thing about that, Will. Other teams are using the portal too, and they feel just they, they feel they are a better team <laughs> as well using the transfer portal. And look, some didn't need to use it as much. Um so I think it's, you know, how much did Florida close the gap by using the transfer portal and, you know, what they they, what they needed to do. They need they needed to use the transfer portal. Uh, so I, I, I look at it like that. You know, other programs used it to, to get better. Some didn't need it to as much. And closing the gap paired with, for Florida, a returning quarterback, Ron Roberts coming in. You know, those are the two biggest factors in me for me of, you know, pairing it with the transfer portal and how much, how better Florida can be. Yeah. So I think there's a couple of places where Florida probably wants to add talent. I think last year, if you look again, pro football focus rankings, these are not in my article because I haven't written about the offense yet, but I've, I've run the numbers and offensive tackle and tight end were the two areas where Florida was below average. They were actually well above average at center. So Jake Slaughter played really well. Offensive guard, they were slightly above average. Halfback, they were a little bit above average. Quarterback, a little bit above average, um, which I think is pretty right. I mean, Graham Mertz played pretty well, but I think there are um, – 
he was not Jaden Daniels. <laughs> I think we can say that. And he wasn't even Carson Beck either. So, you know, look, if you're Florida, what do you what do you need to do to solidify to get up to average? I think tight end specifically blocking. I guarantee you that's a place where pro football focus dinged Florida's tight ends. Blocking in the running game. There's a stat that came out that Florida's offensive line blew blew a higher yeah, percentage yeah. of run plays than like everybody but two programs or something. That's yep. on the tight ends too. The tight ends play a big role in that. I think what you're what's going to be curious is obviously with the guys they brought in on the offensive line with Devin Manuel and Brandon Cr- Cr- eh, Crenshaw Dixon. Those are both guys who've played above average play at tackle in well not necessarily power five, but but big time college football. And is that going to essentially shift things, right? Is Florida going to say, oh, well, now we can take a guy like Damian George and shift him to the inside. Now we could put Cameron Waits at guard. I don't really know what their plan is there, but those are the two places I would probably focus on would be tight end and offensive tackle. The other thing to keep in mind, and I think this is something that we need to keep in mind, is that so there's been a lot of talk comparing Florida's transfer portal for a to old misses transfer portal for a, and I think that's an interesting comparison, but it also misses the point, which is old miss believes that they are on the cusp of winning a championship. And so they are investing heavily in the transfer portal to give themselves the best chance at winning a championship. And with Saban leaving, I think that window is maybe even open a little bit more. And I that's still think be an easier sell to the transfer market. Yeah, but I mean, look, I, I think if you're in the transfer portal, for the most part, you your NIL deals are going to be are going to be comparable. There's going to be bidding, and you know the highest bidder is going to get the money. Now, whether um, you know whether 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 Lane Kiffin is absolutely the highest bidder and everything, I don't necessarily know. What I'll tell you is, I think it's unwise to get into transfer portal bidding wars when you're not a championship level team. And so that, and so that's one of the things I think you need to start figuring out is so think about, there's been a lot of talk back and forth, a lot of stuff going on on Twitter about the boosters needing to step up, the fans needing to support Florida victorious, all that sort of stuff. And if you have over a four year period, a certain number of millions of dollars, and you know what that's going to be, and you know what it costs to bring in these big time recruits, and you know what it costs to bring in guys to the transfer portal, sort of projecting what the inflation is going to be and all that sort of stuff. Would you rather, if you're going to bring in guys who are fourth and fifth year guys, would you, do you bring them in next year to survive the 2024 schedule? And then, and then you're out of funds for the next two years and you sort of sit there in mediocrity. Or do you do what Lane Kiffin's done, which is build a program up to a point where you are now able to compete and now you go all in? And I think that's an interesting philosophical question because funds are limited, right? And clearly the fact that there's all this sniping going on on mm-hmm. about, about funding means funds are limited. And so, you know, for high school recruits, I think you look at it and say, yeah, for the five-star guys, it's probably worth ponying up. Florida's got a couple of those guys. And so, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the two top five guys that they've got in this recruiting class. And that's a big part of how you build a team. Now you got to keep them there. And that's going to be one of the challenges is making sure that those guys don't build at Florida and then go someplace else to dominate. But you've built that foundation. And now I think you probably wait a year or two before you do anything other than solidify. Now you can't have below standard play or below average play everywhere for, for an extended period of time. And so in many ways, that's kind of what I feel like they've done is they've said, Hey, we got some coaching gaps here. We're going to get rid of Corey Raymond. We're going to get rid of Sean Spencer. We're going to bring in Roberts on the defensive side of the ball, which in some ways is an admission that maybe Austin Armstrong needs some help. And then we're going to plug the holes, or at least we're going to go out and we're going to get a broad array of guys who, if they can give us average play, will make our defense much, 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 much better than it was last year. And I think you can say the same thing for the offense. Now, the one thing I will say about the offense is is I'm not sure there's a giant jump in store for Graham Mertz again. And that'll be the question all year, I think, and all offseason is going to be, how much is DJ Lagway going to get to play? Mm-hmm. And what are what are the opportunities he's going to get? Is it going to be like a Tebow thing where he gets in every once in a while? Is it going to be an open competition? Is it going to be he's redshirting? Everybody knows he's redshirting, and that's sort of how things are moving. Um, it'll be curious to see how that is because that is one way to accelerate everything and really make people excited about the program is get some wins with a big-time quarterback who comes in there and, and chucks the ball all over the place. And uh, while I think Graham Mertz played pretty well last year, I don't think he's that guy, so that'll sort of be maybe the curiosity for me. Yeah, it goes back to a, a point I was going to wrap it up with, and you bring it up, Ole Miss. You know, overall for Florida, not in competition with many top programs for a lot of the transfers. Uh, they are now 
What I will say to kind of make that not really sound like a hit on Florida, look, a lot of these transfers, when they enter the transfer portal, they know where they're going anyway. <laughs> so they're comp- there's not a lot of competition to start with. Uh, you know, like, of course, you know, Pup Howard. Hey, I'm going, I'm in the portal. Um, two days later, I'm going to Florida. You know, it, that, that, that happened a lot. Even though these guys may be taking visits elsewhere, it looked like, uh, you know, for, for Bridges and Slackman, we kind of knew Florida was in the lead off those for first initial visits. Um, there wasn't really, you know, opening much of a door uh, for, for, for competition there. Now, some, some of those guys that did enter the portal, there was some big school competition. Florida didn't find themselves in many, in, in many of those. Well, put it this way. Steve Sarkeesian knew he wasn't going to Alabama, but Jimmy Sexton made sure that Texas <laughs> thought he might go. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, 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 yeah, you in the group as well. Yeah. So, and so it works the same way when it comes yep. to this. Right. And, and, and these guys are allowed to have representation now too. And so there's an opportunity there for back channel communication, even before they go in the portal. Um, the big time guys who go in the portal, they already know pretty much where they're going and understand what the opportunities are and, and those sorts of things. And you can can't stop guys you can't stop players from talking to other players so there's avenues for that too um i I think at the end of the day if you're not tampering you're not trying at this point and that's just sort of the reality of the situation and you can be moral or you can win and you got to decide what you got you got to decide which one you want to do um and sometimes you're going to get caught and if you get caught well hey there might be some penalties and you'll have to deal with the, the ramifications of that as it goes down board but obviously as we saw with michigan um they let you get away with a few things so uh you know it will we'll sort of see uh see, see where stuff arises or where, where stuff go ends up or lands with what florida's going through with the rashada stuff right now but um look i, I think um there's two things. One is that there's the tampering, obviously, where guys know where they're going even before they enter the portal. The other aspect of it is you got to have something to sell. And if I'm a fifth year senior and I want to win a championship and I have the skill that will allow me to start on a championship level team, I'm not coming to Florida. Mm-hmm. Not right now. And so oh. there is something to building the program to a place where you, and this is the thing that I would, that I was trying to say about Ole Miss is Ole Miss is at a point where if you're a guy who thinks he wants to win a title, but doesn't necessarily just want to jump on the Georgia bandwagon or the Ohio State bandwagon. Old Miss is a pretty cool place to go, and you'd be a legend if you came there as a transfer and helped them win a national championship just because of what what historically the SEC has been and how Old Miss has sort of been a not a doormat, but where Old Miss has been one of the lower tier teams in the SEC West. That would no longer be true if you go there. So Lane Kiffin spent some time building that, you know. Florida and Ole Miss were kind of similar places right when right when Kiffin came in. Maybe I mean I would say Florida was even in a better position than than Ole Miss was when Lane Kiffin came in. He's built that slowly, and now he's going all in. Florida now, was, did the Florida was his first game as yeah. head coach at Ole Miss uh, in that 2020 season, right? Yeah. So, so the question you have to ask is, uh, or the question I would have to ask is, um, did Lane Kiffin just sort of? get hired right at the right time to where when they were ready to go all in this transfer portals out there, or is it strategic in that they've looked at it and said, this is the best way to build our program. I would suggest it's strategic mainly because they went and got transfer portal guys before early signing day, knowing that old miss doesn't compete with Alabama, Georgia, and Ohio State on signing day, and they said the place we're going to compete is by coming in and bringing in these guys in the transfer portal, and we're going to gain an advantage there. If you were going to criticize Napier for anything, I think that's actually the one place where you could be where you could give a fair criticism of the transfer portal is prices were probably lower before early signing day, and prices are now probably going up for anybody who's still holding out just because there's a limited supply of players who can really make a difference. And so all of a sudden, if they're choosing between different programs, the the demand's going to be up for those guys. And I'd say the same thing for the spring is truly elite guys who decide to transfer. They're going to be able to pick their place and it's going to yeah. be costly to bring them in. And so one lesson maybe to be learned from this is that when it's time to go all in, hit it early, hit it before early signing day, assuming they don't change the calendar and all that stuff, hit it early to try to get those guys in, get them committed. And while everybody else is sort of holding on to their to their NIL money so that they can bring in the guys through the high school through the high school ranks. There's a school in Tuscaloosa that might be uh roster hunting after spring 
So <laughs> I suspect they'll be pretty effective. Uh, yeah, probably so. Probably so. Uh, ultimately, we'll and, we'll and we'll move on. You know, is this enough on a team that won five games last season? Uh, I think that's the question we have to ask ourselves. I do think it makes Florida better. And, and going to your point, it's not making Florida better to make Florida a championship roster in 2024. It's to make Florida go beat the likes of Kentucky and Missouri and South Carolina and Arkansas. You know, th- those level of games. You know, for so for Florida this year, Tennessee. And um, I say, unfortunately, they don't play many of those teams. Right, this right, year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the schedule is going to uh, be a bump there, but you're Miami's, your UCF's, you know, your, your first few games of the uh, of the season, and go steal one later in the season. That's where the transfer portal is supposed to be put in Florida in 2024. I, I, I do, I do like the pieces here. Maybe a couple more. I, I think you know, looking at it overall, I do like what they have. I just wish there was a, probably a couple more guys at you know, pretty much the level. Uh, the, uh, that they came in here with. So there we go, man, 40 minutes on transfer portal. There we go. That's what happens when we're when we're not together for a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but Hey, plenty of uh, fun to be had. We know the big games coming up. Everybody put cash in your wallet with my bookie. My bookie has the biggest online selection of odds and contests to fill all your sports betting needs anytime, anywhere. So you can turn that sports knowledge into cash in your wallet. Chiefs and 49ers bet on the big game or play for a share of big cash prizes in the weekly blackjack tournaments at my bookie. If you've been waiting for the right time to get in on the action, there's one more big matchup on the gridiron to do so. Make your winning move today. Sign up at my bookie. Use promo code Gators and claim your deposit match. Redeemable up to $1,000. Again, that's promo code Gators to claim your bonus. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. A little bit of news, and we can react to this one too. We'll uh, tease it earlier, but we'll give uh, credit here to Swamp 24-7. Jacob Rudner on Sunday originally broke the news for Florida hiring Joe Houston as senior analyst for special teams. Uh, Houston 37 would join the Gators in an off-field capacity, uh, had been with the Patriots since 2020, since 2020 there in the NFL. Iowa State before that as special teams coordinator in quality control roles. Uh, he was in line to coach special teams under Nick Saban at Alabama in 2020 before going to the Patriots. Houston will work with current game changer coordinator Chris Couch, who is set to return for another season for Florida. Uh, at Florida, spokesperson has said Houston will work closely with Couch while also focusing on special teams and situational football. We all know the issues in those two areas last year, Will. So, look, not uncommon for – you know, they're not to be a dedicated special teams coach on game day on the sideline. That's happening at other programs as well. You can argue if it because of the issues, if that should be the case at Florida, but it's not a unique thing to Florida and Billy Napier and how he wants to build his staff. Uh, but if you look on the sideline, Will, they're still involved. So this whole on-field, off-field thing, I think, kind of maybe gets glossed over a little bit on game days. <laughs> um, but look, that was apparent last season after struggles – Brandon Taylor, a grad assistant, he has some more responsibilities on game days instead of Couch. Couch will still be on staff, and I know that rubs some people the wrong way, but keeping him on staff, Will, and I tweeted this yesterday, that's not going to ultimately determine Billy Napier's fate here. Uh, Now, we can look at it maybe a couple of ways. I know it's been asked why he's still on staff. Is this a UAA move and trying to save money and not have a buyout or is Napier keeping a long time assistant because he just doesn't want to let go. You know, I don't care the the reason you know, bring it, bring it in Houston. That's a clear upgrade. Um, I have a hard time seeing a scenario where couch brings him down. Uh, no potential improvement happening because Chris couch is still here with the addition, this new addition of Houston. Well, the, the role special teams coordinator and especially situational football stand out. Changes being made in those two crucial areas here. Yeah, I mean, certainly changes need to be made when it came to special teams. Um, though I would argue that special teams were maybe a symptom of what we saw on the field, not necessarily the disease. <laughs> and, and the disease had more to do with a team that looked unprepared in many games, especially when they were on the road, and a team that quite honestly looked a little bit lackadaisical a few times when they were out there on the road specifically. Um, the it, 
this can only help having someone in there. The only right. disadvantage to having more than one person responsible for something is you get multiple pe- multiple voices telling people what to do and they don't really know what to do. So as long as they've delineated exactly who you're supposed to listen to, who will be accountable, all that sort of stuff, I don't think it's really that big of a deal. And and it, when you're looking at like coaches who are off-field analysts, you're really talking about opportunity costs. And the only opportunity cost is money. Right. I mean, because you're allowed to have an unlimited number of off off field assistants. And so bringing in another one while leaving one in place doesn't really change anything unless, like I said, the voice of the person who's in in place is stronger than the person who's now taken charge. And when that happens, I think then then you make a change. I, I have no ill will towards towards couch. I think the special team certainly underperformed last year, but I don't think that was the only unit that underperformed last year. I mean, I think if you're going to have the same discussion, you got to start talking about the defensive coordinator. You got to start talking about the linebackers coach. You got to start talking about the corners and safeties coaches. You got to start talking about, um, you got to start. And, and on that note, Will, I mean, is this, and I've seen the word out there, maybe for lack of a better term, babysitters, Ron Roberts, Austin Armstrong, Houston, Chris Couch. I mean, is that a look? There's many of Gator Nation wanted changes to be made. Changes were made. Now, maybe not to the full effect. <laughs> many wanted out there with these guys still on staff, but changes to be made. I think it's defensive coordinator Armstrong Roberts. That dynamic is still how that's going to work. I still think is is in question, but. This one here is pretty clear, cut and dry to me. Yeah, I mean, as long as again, the, I have bigger concerns about the Armstrong, the Armstrong Roberts, who's the biggest voice in the room, yeah, than I do about these guys, right? I, I think it's pretty pretty clear who's going to be the person who gets the criticism if the special teams are awful, and who's going to get the credit if the special teams are much improved, right? <laughs> when it comes to the defensive side of the ball, now I start wondering about it, right? Like if all of a sudden the defense improves, does Austin Armstrong get the credit for it improving, or do people start crediting? Roberts for the improvement on defense there. I think the biggest, the biggest voice in the room starts to make a little bit of a difference. The thing I've sort of said all along about all of these changes or the changes that people have been clamoring for and those sorts of things is that I'd actually feel if, if Billy Napier makes changes because he thinks changes are necessary, good for him. If Billy Napier makes changes because he's feeling the heat, then that's indicative of a poor leader. So if he doesn't make some changes that people want, I'm actually okay with that. So long as he's willing to accept the consequences on the other side, right? So if there's no offensive coordinator and that doesn't materialize, and Florida's offense sort of sits there in the 50 to 60 range. Nobody takes a leap forward, and the offense can't get things going in the fourth quarter when they need it and those sorts of things. Look, Napier's not going to be around for very long, but he stuck to his guns and what he believed in, and it didn't work out for him. Okay, I can actually respect somebody who does that. It's the person who says, well, the fans really want this, so I'm going to bring them in anyway, and then you end up with all sorts of additional problems because that's not leadership. And what's so, the, if, if, what's the saying on that, Will? If you listen to the fans, you end up being one. <laughs> well, <laughs> of a different team, probably the way this fan base goes after people. But um, <laughs> look, I mean, we we saw it with Dan Mullen, who very there you uh, go, who who adjust who didn't adjust didn't get rid of Todd Grantham and that ends up costing him his job but I can at least respect Mullen for holding on to Grantham even if it was the wrong move I can respect him for holding on to Grantham because he's like look I'm gonna go down with the ship he went down with the ship that's all right it kind of accelerated the ship going down in in many ways there yeah there is a fine line of staying comfortable and ride that comfortability of getting you out of a hole instead of remodeling. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, to me, the question is always, do you want to do the remodel or are you doing the remodel for the neighbors that you have over twice a year? And if you're doing the remodel for the neighbors you have over twice a year, just rent a place and <laughs> like go, go have dinner someplace that, like, you know, go out to a really nice dinner. Like, you know, there are other ways to do it that don't cost you the money on the remodel. Whereas if you look at it and go, this house really does need to be remodeled. There are things fundamentally wrong with it. We need to fix it. Okay. Well now it makes sense to spend the money and actually do the remodel. So that to me is the key here is that if, if you look at it, um, Napier has specifically said, and, and, you know, Think about what I said earlier about the places that Florida was below average on defense, linebacker, safety, and corner. Those are the three places and the secondary coach and the linebacker coach, the linebacker coach left for an upgraded job, but still those guys aren't on the, aren't on the staff anymore. Right. 
don't think that's necessarily a coincidence that places where guys were underperforming are places where we saw saw guys go. The interior linemen weren't necessarily great. The defensive ends weren't necessarily great. Okay, Spencer goes too. Um, and, and so, fine. But I think if Florida's defense had been even remotely serviceable, Florida wins more games last year, yeah. right? If it was just serviceable. And if Florida's defense had been elite, Florida wins nine games. So um, there's an opportunity there to see rapid improvement on both of those sides. And again, I'm not here necessarily to defend Billy Napier in terms of what he wants to do. I'm just here to say that as a leader, sometimes you have to make decisions that are unpopular with your fan base. Like I wouldn't want to be Dan Campbell today after calling those fourth down <laughs> and calling that timeout off to the running play on, on third down there down the red zone. But they are sticking, sticking to his guns and something that had worked all season long. Yeah, the running play is the one I have more trouble with. But, <laughs> but 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 again, Dan Campbell has to Dan Campbell stood up afterwards said I do it again. He protects his players, that's leadership. I think it's the same thing for Billy Napier. And he's going to have to do the same thing for these guys. Like in some ways he needs to come out and say, "Guys, look, our special teams is a team effort, but this guy's going to be held responsible when the special teams either are succeed or fail." And as long as you set that as the expectation, then, you know, Everybody knows, right? Couch is an assistant to the assistant and everything runs smoothly. Same thing if you set that early on with Roberts and Armstrong. Roberts is an assistant to the assistant. Armstrong is the one who's going to be making the calls. He's going to be the one who's responsible. And quite honestly, look at how humble Armstrong is at allowing someone with the resume of Roberts to come in and help with the defense. Hey, that shows a level of maturity for somebody who needs to grow in the position. I think you could spin it that way too, right? Now, when everything goes down the drain, it'll be that there's conflict between those two guys and, and it's a mess. And how could you bring those guys in and all that sort of stuff. But Again, I sort of go back. That's kind of the same thing with the Campbell example with the Lions. If he converts both of those fourth downs and they're playing in the Super Bowl, everybody goes, oh, Dan Campbell, always going for it on fourth down. Way to be aggressive. That 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 leads over into his team, and they play aggressively that way because it's really easy to look at the result and say, I knew that was going to happen. But one of the reasons that we have analytics is to help us make decisions or help coaches make decisions when they don't know what the outcome is going to be. So it's the same thing here as I'm looking at all the changes Napier's making, and we can be critical early on. But if I'm not going to sit here and rail against the Ron Roberts hiring now, now, I sure as heck shouldn't come in, say, October, November, when it doesn't look like it's doing well, and rail against it then. I, yeah. I need to have the stones to come in and say, I don't like it now, because then then downstream, maybe I can say something about it. I don't feel bad about this one. I actually think that's a good hire. At the same time, I'm, I shouldn't be able to then go, oh, I always knew that wasn't going to work, or you, you should never mix those sorts yeah, yeah. of things downstream. Same thing for the special teams, right? I well, think this is this you, is a, you, you, you do have an example a year ago at Austin Armstrong. <laughs> yeah, I've missed a few too, so we won't go back to that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> no, I mean, look, I, I think there's, 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 so to me, that's the point, right? Is let's throw it all out on the table and say, do we think this is a good hire for Florida or not? And I think this is a very good hire at the at the at the special teams position. This is a guy who's dealt with adults in the NFL. This is a guy who also has college experience. This is a guy who Alabama thought highly enough to bring in and potentially give an opportunity before he went to New England. So you think about Belichick and Saban have given this guy the stamp of approval. And so I think that's certainly an upgrade over what Florida's had. But sometimes things go wrong. And so hopefully Napier has targeted the right guy and hopefully that turns into a successful um, improvement in special teams this year not just kicking but you know the 11 guys on the field and uh you know no stupid penalties and all that sort of stuff all right all right uh and then last little headline for this episode espn's sec network analyst or not analyst host paul feinbaum uh, of course was on he was on mcelroy and kubrick uh there been on that show a couple times uh, but McElroy and Kublik in the morning, they were discussing, and uh, I'm assuming they, they were asking Florida or Tennessee, you know, who's under more pressure? Uh, and Paul Feinbaum was, look, of course, uh, I think anybody would say Florida in, in this situation, given Billy Napier's first two seasons, 11 wins. Of course, both teams have high expectations. New quarterbacks, um, there are new quarterback for Tennessee, Graham Mertz, um, coming back for Florida. How does that play into the dynamic? But for Tennessee, Feinbaum said, and I think in the Tennessee case, there's an exception or there's an expectation with a new regime at quarterback. And when Nico took over, I think everybody felt very positive. I would hate to see Tennessee backslide. I don't think they're going to. 
Uh, and of course, not as confident for Florida is Paul Feinbaum. Uh, for Florida, however, it hasn't been too impressed with head coach Billy Napier. Quote, Feinbaum says, Greg, everyone is whispering about Billy Napier. There's no reason to whisper about it. He had a terrible season. No matter how many times his AD comes out and tries to say there's nothing here, there's a lot there. There is apathy at Florida that concerns me more than the record. I talked to Steve Spurrier a couple of weeks ago. He said, ah, there's not much buzz going on around here. I talked to a reporter the other day. They said the same thing. I talked to former player Thaddeus Bullard last week. Everyone's saying the same thing. There's just no excitement, Feinbaum said. There's almost an expectation now that winning six, seven games is good enough. Well, you know what? It's not. This is year three, and at some point, you just have to accept whether you have the right coach or not, and until somebody can make a clear statement at Florida and a convincing statement, then that mystery will be there, and the schedule has been passed around by all of us many, many times. Um, goes on to say, but it's really when your coach is under fire, the beginning of the season is critical. You can't come out the gate losing. They have a very tricky schedule with a lot of games that don't look that difficult but are losable. If Billy Napier starts out very poorly, the question is, can he make it to the end? Said Feinbaum. So, Will, that brings that, that last part brings up, you know, we know how critical this is a year for Billy Napier. 11 wins in two seasons. That's hard to that's hard to fathom for much of Gator Nation. That's hard to give a pass to, no matter the situation Florida finds themselves in. And it certainly does mean your three needs to be better. I don't think you go another 500, another below 500, and and really defensible to bring him back for another year. I hope it's much better than that. Uh, and kind of going to, yeah, the schedule has been passed around. There are some winnable games up front. The, the start is very, very important there. But, and I said this when the schedule was released, Will. I was like, there's more dread with the schedule than there is excitement with the schedule. If Florida was Florida, you know how much we'd be looking forward to a schedule like that and embracing the schedule. And I think, I look, I think some of Gator Nation is uh, out there. I don't think apathy is completely set in all throughout Gator Nation. It is there. I know it's there. I have been told my interest is waning. And I've been told that completely by many of Gator Nation out there, whether it be at the stadium, whether it be walking to the stadium, be on Discord, whether it be on Twitter. I have been told the interest just isn't there anymore because of, you know, Dan Mullins last season, 11 wins through Billy Napier. So, yeah, apathy is there. Honestly, we're going to see. There's going to be a packed-out swamp <laughs> week one versus Miami. So it's not all the way there. Uh, but, you know, Spurrier says it. Thaddeus Bullard says it. Reporters are saying it. I mean, 11 wins in two seasons, it, it's pretty explainable why, you know, the excitement level probably isn't where it can and should be. Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's – two things to parse there one is that i actually think tennessee is under more pressure because the expectations for tennessee with nick saban leaving and the expectations for tennessee with Imaleva taking over at quarterback and the expectations for hypel taking a step back in that year three with milton but now you've got now you've got nico taking over that five-star quarterback who's gonna who's gonna take him to the promised land what happens if they go eight and four and and Imaleva looks looks ugh. Sort of, eh. you know, looks like Joe Milton. Like what happens, right? Like all of a sudden now you got an antsy fan base in Knoxville where the expectations were 11 wins and Texas and Oklahoma come in and they finish sixth in the SEC or seventh in the SEC. Let's say they lose to Florida again because, you know, they've only done that like 30 of the last 32 <laughs> times or something. So let's say they lose to Florida again. All of a sudden now all the old ghosts come up. And, and all that sort of stuff. So I think there's quite a bit of pressure on Tennessee. I think the pressure on Florida is just a question of survival, really. Mm. And, and I get that there's apathy, but I think the apathy goes away the minute Billy Napier gives Florida fans reason to hope. It's one of the reasons why I think that DJ Lagway has to play early on, even if it's a Tebow role, even if it's like getting him out there in limited amounts yeah. of, of time, like there has to be this, Hey, 
we may not be winning this year, but we see the path to winning with this guy. That's the thing that Napier has to cast. And honestly, that's the, the product for college football is hope we're going to win a championship or hope we're building to a championship. And the reason you see the apathy in some folks is they don't see the hope we're building towards a championship and they don't see the hope of a championship. And when you see those two things combined, I get it. I understand why things will things will things will pull back you know you you make up a good point Will, before before we go to your next point excitement a lag way is our excitement i think there's an excitement behind a grand merch returning i think there's a lot of excitement at the quarterback spot the most important position on the field so i do think there is a reason to be excited there and i just think you know the worry sets in once again there are some moves we talked about with ron roberts though is is the excitement on offense, Wilson coming back at receiver as well. Is that enough to make up for the defense? And you know that's that's where the apathy I think kind of sets in, or the worry, or but I, I, I don't think there's a lack of excitement now. Maybe national a national scale, sure, uh, you can sell me on that. Uh, it, it, there's probably not a lot of other fan bases out there excited about you know watching uh, a Florida team. There are some pieces I think that maybe can change that. Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple of things um, that that sort of go into that. So, as someone who unfortunately is a Buffalo Bills fan, I knew that field goal was going wide right from the moment the guy lined up, and until it go and as somebody and so I completely empathize with the Detroit Lion fans who knew at halftime they were going to blow that game the other day. And when you become sort of a wounded fan base. Like the the Boston Red Sox were like this all the time. Like when when Aaron Boone hit that home run in, in Game Seven, you just like felt the screech from Boston when that happened. And when you become a wounded fan base, well, now all of a sudden that's sort of what you expect. And it's not necessarily an apathy; it's more of a when's the next shoe going to drop, or in not Florida's get, case, be thrown. Not get and hopes up. not get hopes up. Not get your hopes up, right? And so I think in many ways people are setting expectations to be disappointed so that if Florida exceeds those expectations, it'll be a good year. And if Florida doesn't exceed those expectations, they're like, well, it's exactly what I expected anyway. Of course, those bums, whatever. Right. And, and for years, again, as a bills fan for years after the four straight super bowls, they were just awful for years and years and years. And, and they were, they weren't even awful enough to like get high draft picks. They were awful enough. They'd go like four and 12 every year and just, you know, draft 11th or 12th and they'd never get the quarterback they needed until they finally got Josh Allen. Then they bring in Josh Allen. All of a sudden there's hope with the team and, you know, but still there's that thing in me that's just waiting for the field goal to go wide, right. And lo and behold, it did this year. So I think I think Florida's gonna have to battle through both of those. And and it's funny when when Urban Meyer came to Florida, there were so many games where I went into the game thinking Meyer doesn't lose these games. Yeah, and, and you're just sitting there going, he doesn't. And so I don't expect Florida to lose that, especially after the stretch where you get where you get the Jarvis Moss block against South Carolina, you get the fake punt against against Arkansas, you get the game where Florida's a huge underdog against Ohio State, you get the initial ball, the initial kickoff return for a touchdown, and then they just wax them the rest of the game. From then on, it was like, all right, Urban Meyer doesn't lose games that he doesn't want to lose. And in 2008, when they were playing Oklahoma, everybody's like, how are they going to stop that offense from Oklahoma? I'm like, I have zero worries. Like this guy's going to take care of it. He had earned that, right? He had earned that over time, both through recruiting, but also through just on the field. He had earned that. And so one of the things that that I've said over and over and over again over the last few months is Billy Napier's taken an awful lot of withdrawals from the bank in his first two years as coach, and he's going to have to start making some deposits. And whether those deposits are winning a game that he shouldn't because he's able to out-scheme or out-coach the opposition, whether it's full that's point. Happened. That's going to happen more. Yeah, Utah, whether it's Utah well, year one, Tennessee last year. I mean, that has happened. It's just man, it's been able to be built upon. Well, whether it's being able to coax – an extra possession out of an onside kick or, or doing something unique. Like one of my favorite Belichick stories when he retired was the game against the Ravens a few years ago where he lined up his, his offensive lineman, or he basically had a tight end come in as eligible, had a wide receiver declare ineligible, but still line up at wide receiver. And then Baltimore had no idea who to guard. And finding those little edges was something that Belichick did really, really well. The interesting thing was is Alabama had run the exact same thing against LSU earlier in the year. And so Saban's staff found it. Saban's staff 
or I'm sorry, Belichick staff found it. Belichick staff fa- figured out a way to implement it in a better way against the Ravens to a point where they actually outlawed it from football and you're not allowed to do it anymore. But those sorts of things, like make some deposits, right? Like one of the things I, I really miss about Napier is he was such a gunslinger against Tennessee. He went for those two-point conversions. They missed them both. They were down five after they get the onside kick. But that game, he gave Florida a chance to win a game that they had no idea. They had no idea. Or they, they had no reason to be in that game. And he did everything to help them get more and more and more win percentage in that game. And then they just came up a little bit short. At the same time, that guy did a great job of putting Florida in a position to win. And I want to see that guy again. Make some deposits. Make me believe that you're going to be able to give me a win over Georgia. Maybe we don't win against Georgia, but the game plan should be awesome. The game plan should be aggressive, and the game plan should look like Florida believes they're going to be able to come out to win. And that'd be pretty awesome if we started to see that this year. Uh, and I don't, and I don't think, you know, apathy, and you know. Bud are, are really the same thing. I mean, I think there's plenty of, you know, there, there may not be buzz, but I don't, I don't think that necessarily means apathy. It's just, like you said, it's just the the needing to see it. Let me see it first before I get excited. I think that's, like you said, it's kind of setting the expectation. I don't think that necessarily, lack of buzz and apathy are, aren't necessarily the same thing to me. And maybe that's the core. Maybe and maybe that's the correlation. I think he's he's uh, making too much of. Well, I I think there's a lot of people. So you think about like elections. Most people don't pay any attention to who's actually in the election until like <laughs> until they come back from summer vacation, like in September. And oh, look, there's an election going on, and and that's when they make a decision. I think there's a lot of people in college football who use it as a social function. They like to see their team do well. But they sort of zone out when it comes to recruiting and and all that sort of stuff, especially now with the transfer portal and new guys being on every team. I think there's going to be people who are just going to come back, look, oh, buy their preseason magazines, look at it, go, oh, that's who's on my roster this year. Let's ride. And those people aren't necessarily going to contribute to a buzz or or a lack of buzz in, in any way, way, shape, or form. But then you get the people who are extraordinarily passionate, the people who are listening to us in January talk about the team. And I think in that case, there tends to be a cynicism when a program has gone through some of the downs that Florida has gone through over the last three or four years and really over the last decade. And so that cynicism is interpreted as a, as a lack of buzz or a lack of passion. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think in many ways it's a frustration because of the passion that you're hearing. And so these are people who are trying to set themselves up not to get wounded again. I get it. I did the same thing uh, again, Bill's fan here. I understand, but, but Bill's fan and Gators fan. It's been a rough, rough few years here, but, uh, um, but you know, the, the, the thing is, is that when Florida has a lead with 13 seconds left, like Buffalo did against Kansas city a few years ago, like I'm still going to be sitting there on my hands going, Oh no, how are we going to figure out how to screw this thing up until it's proven otherwise? And I think that's to me, that's the, the buzz that he's talking about and that sort of stuff is the people who are really passionate about it are the people that Bullard and Spurrier and the reporter are going to go to and hear from this time of year. And once things turn around, all of a sudden there's a buzz because those are the people that those folks interact with this time of year. So I think that's probably some of it. And quite honestly, I, I think we've seen it. I mean, we, we see it with, with the fan base in terms of, Again, not apathy, but cynicism, and yeah. and that's maybe the the differentiating factor. Not that it matters. I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, like you said, the swamp's going to be sold out. Florida's still part of the SEC. People are going to be interested in the games when they kick off. But you know, why torture yourself in February when every recruiting battle seems to go against you, <laughs> and when you're not signing the guys in the transfer portal that you want and that sort of stuff? I get it. You just sort of go, you know what? I'm going to watch the NFL for a little bit. I'm going to check out, watch the NBA. I'll come back in August when everything kicks off and, and get started from there. Or, or, or and, and, and kind of the shirt in some way represents it, or can't wait till baseball season. So. <laughs> baseball another, school, man. Baseball yeah, school. That's, that's another one that's floating out there. But yeah, I mean, look, look, most people who listen to this are diehards. You know, there, there, there won't ever be apathy. Most people that are listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown, if you're a fan of Gators Breakdown, if you're listening to 
Will or reading Will and reading Gators Breakdown. I mean, look, you're diehards. You know, you're invested in it. You're you're right here with us. <laughs> so uh, there, there's no apathy really setting in from you know you guys out there listening and uh, and us here talking. So that's just uh, it's just it, it, look, that, that's just Florida. I, I, yes, I know it's out there, but I don't think it's on some major major scale major scale out there. So all right, there we go, Will. Yeah, man. Good to be back. It's been good yeah. to talk about it. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, so we got cooking up, as I said. Now, what your next piece that reading reaction? Tease it one more time. Or I mean, so what, you got, got what you got up there now, and what what's coming up? So I have two coming. I've got one that's going to be showing sort of the same spider charts that I showed for the uh, offensive side of the ball, so you can see where it's important to have um, to have critical play there. I think that actually bodes well for Florida moving forward over the next couple of years. And then, uh, and then I've got a, an article called "The Mertz Conundrum" because it's really interesting that I think depending upon what lens you look through determines how you view the 2023 season and what it's going to look like in 2024. And uh, I think it's important that people set expectations appropriately for that. And then we're <laughs> the big thing for us is we're working on our uh, 2024 preseason magazine. So oh, yeah. trying trying to trying to square up the advertisers for that. And certainly if people are interested, reach out to me. Um, but uh, but that's always our big thing is right around Memorial Day, have that come out so everybody's got our, our big preview magazine for the beach. Good stuff, good stuff. Looking forward to that. Um, a lot of work goes into that there with you and Nick. So uh, looking forward to uh, the Gator theme preseason magazine. So, all right, one more time. Trey on web later this week on Gators Breakdown. That'll do it for this episode. Will Miles, readreaction.com on YouTube at uh, Read Reaction. And I'm the host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on social media at Gator Dave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thank you for joining us on this episode of Gators Breakdown.